Steve, thank you so much for joining me. We have a, about a year until the caucuses, a little less than now. Now, you have to tell us, what does the Faith and Freedom Coalition do here in Iowa? Well, first of all, we're nonpartisan. We don't endorse candidates. <clears throat> of course, people that support our organization could do what they want to do. As an organization, we don't endorse anybody. I don't endorse anybody. We want to do voter education. Uh, that's what we do to the, the masses. But in terms of the candidates, we want to have access to all of them. So that's one reason <clears throat> we don't endorse or get involved in those. Uh, secondly, in my role, apart from that, with the Republican National Committee, we're also forbidden from endorsing candidates. So when you're the first caucus state, um, you know, you kind of need to be nice to all of them and give them a forum from which to speak. And then activists can ask them the uh, tough but diplomatic questions, you know. So it's all about like this tonight and others will have in the future. It's all about educating the voters. And of course, that's what we do <clears throat> in every general election every two years is whether it's for president or U.S. Senate or the U.S. House or sometimes like the last election, we got involved in the attorney general's race. Um, we get involved in some key uh, competitive state legislative races. And again, we don't endorse anybody. We just say, here's where candidate A stands on this issue, and here's where candidate B set, stands on that same issue, then letting voters uh, decide who they want to vote for. And of course, we always document that information by, with a footnote, where did that come from? Did it come from a voting record? Did it come from a public statement they made, or was it a statement they made in a form? So it's never guesswork. It's always very well documented that this is where these candidates stand on the issues. So tonight's event is a fundraiser, correct? Mm -hmm. And so what does that money go towards when people are here and they hear these candidates, they hear where they stand on the issues? Where does the money go towards? Most of it goes for voter education. Uh, as I just mentioned, you know, the national <clears throat> puts in money, but we put money in, but we do basically the bulk of it for voter education. Then also we have a lobbyist where you're going to hear from a little bit later tonight, a lobbyist up at the Capitol uh, that signs on to or against uh, pieces of legislation that we lobby on up at the Capitol. So as an example, um, you know, we signed on to the bathroom bill, we signed on to the prohibition of uh, transgender uh, uh, surgeries before the age of 18. And so other issues where there's good people on both sides of that issue uh, that maybe aren't directly f faith related, and I'll give you a couple examples. So. Uh, you got the death penalty that we've got good people on both sides support or oppose. You've got an issue like this very controversial in Iowa, the pipeline, building a pipeline across Iowa. And the third one that's very controversial is um, Convention of States Article 5. You know, some people are for it, some people are against it. So those issues don't really have a correlation with our mission. And so in those particular issues at the Capitol, we just basically put undecided, which means we're not going to get involved in those. But issues that impact uh, the traditional family um, and or religious liberty, uh, we're more than likely to get involved in lobby for or against, you know, certain bills, you know. Now we've got to talk about the first in the nation status. Obviously, Republicans are still going strong with Iowa being their first caucus of the season and Democrats were stripped of their first in the nation status. What are your thoughts? We would have preferred the Democrats have gone with us because that makes us stronger as a state, I think. I mean, we, that's what we would have loved to have. But the problem is they kind of muck things up. Last cycle, we really don't know if Bernie Sanders won or Peter P. Butichek won, won the caucuses. You know, you get this group that stands in this corner, this corner, people stand in this corner, and then if they don't have 15%, they have to coalesce together. Um, and then when they didn't have their whole um, reporting process tested, and it broke down. Um, and then on top of that, <clears throat> the Democrats have all these convoluted rules that, you know, you got to have a certain percentage of, that are minorities or a certain percentage of people that um, are uh, union members in the workforce. They get all these categories by which they place people. And Iowa, in my view, is a colorblind state. I mean, this is a pretty white state. But Barack Obama won the caucuses here pretty easily. And so I think Iowans... You know, they're very intelligent. They ask the tough questions, the diplomatic questions. Um, and where else can you start that? You can't start that in a big state like a Michigan or California or Pennsylvania. We don't always pick the winner. In fact, a lot of times we don't. But at least you have that first sifting or vetting. 
And then, of course, sometimes New Hampshire maybe do the opposite. So like last time, Cruz won the caucuses here, but in New Hampshire, Trump won the primary. But you have that sifting out, and then other states can kind of figure that out. But if you don't have little states where voters can have a in-depth one-on-one conversation with a candidate, that candidate's not going to be very strong going into the general election if he, all he knows is, um, you know, doing media buys or advertisements that, you know, where the candidates aren't really vetted, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot to say. Uh, so we're proud of our status. And, um, you know, at least in New Hampshire, the Democrats um, beat on the Democratic National Committee for giving them the acts. Uh, there are two Democrat U.S. senators to their credit basically let it be known they were not happy at all. Unlike our state where some of the Democratic elder statesmen like Tom Vilsack, Tom Harkin never said a word, not a word about Iowa being ripped of our First Nation status. So I think as long as our caucuses go flawlessly on our side, I think that'll make a good case for us to stay stay first in 2028. But it is a little bit concerning that Democrats aren't with us because it would have made us stronger, I think, as far as an argument to stay first in 2028. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. You're welcome.